the all the causes and um, things. I hope that that was not too fast, but uh, Shaima will tell us. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fabia, for your presentation. It was really informative. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of people were asking the question that how, what is the normal range? So we're talking about, we were talking about regular beating and irregular cycles, but um, we have, we do have a lot of young medical students as well with us, and we're still unclear about how many days would we consider normal and how many days beyond that do we really ring the bell that this is an abnormal cycle? So, so what is the answer to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So always, all the medical students, keep this in front of you, all right? Because this is your, um, uh, this is uh, your, um, sorry, uh, this is your, 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 your page, and this is what you have to tell everyone, okay? What is the frequency? 24 to 30 days, 38 days. is normal. Imagine 38 days is what, 30 days plus 8 days. So if somebody has a regular cycle of 38 days, up to 38 days, reassure them that that's normal. Who said 21 is normal? 20, anything less than 24 is abnormal. 21 is three weeks. That's not normal. It has to be 24 to 38 days, okay? And a total number of days should be eight days. So only if you have periods more than eight days, then it is abnormal. So the white patches in this in this diagram, you can see the white, they are the normality. Anything which is not in the white is abnormal. Does that answer the question? Yes, yes, that answers the question perfectly. Thank you, Dr. Fabia. Um, also, and, and this, is the, this is the paper, so you can always yeah. read the paper. Also. Okay, all right, right. okay. And um, so we were getting a lot of questions about PCOS. So for PCOS, a lot of people were asking, um, is there an exact treatment for it? Or is it something that is lifelong? So that's my half hour of next lecture. <laughs> okay, so um, Dr. Sadia, actually we're having a little is issue with this link. Is it okay if I regenerate a new link and mm -hmm. we can uh, continue our lecture on that link? Yeah, so we can finish any, any other yeah. questions on this one? Or you want me to, we'll take the questions in the next link. Yeah, right? okay, perfect. Thank you. So everyone, all the participants as well, uh, a new link will be shared and you guys can join in on that as well. Thank you so much. See you, so I will, see you there. I shall log out of this one. Um, yeah, we can, and then you can join the new link. Thank you.
Hi, Samnik Sadak Sadia. Thanks for rejoining. Sorry about the technical issue. Um, you can, we can now, I think, continue on to um, uh, the next lecture because a lot okay. of our questions are about PCOS. PCOS, oh my God. Okay. Um, let's start with PCOS then. You can see it? Um, I can see you. Wait. You're sharing you. your screen? I am sharing my screen with so share screen. Uh, I you have to. Is it disabled? I think you'll have to enable me. Oh, first. okay, okay. One second, sorry. Yeah, now we can share it. Okay. Uh, now we can see it, yeah. Okay, great. Um, you know, your little boxes were coming in my way, but I'm going to move that away. Okay, let's okay. see. Oh, so you can hear me now. Yeah. Again, I, I like to practice uh, what I, I preach, okay? Mm -hmm. And that would be my advice to everybody listening about polycystic ovary syndrome and also I want, I'm directly communicating to all those girls who have been diagnosed who have polycystic ovaries, okay? And I want you all to listen and say, and inshallah, more than half of you will today undiagnose yourself to have PCOS, okay? Because that is the mission that I am on, that I will only diagnose somebody to have polycystic ovary not because of what she comes in and tells me, or not because when I look at her and say, oh, she's so polycystic. No. Yeah. In, in that criteria, everyone has got polycystic ovary. Everyone is PCOS now. That is not right. So you have to go back and look at the evidence. And, and whatever, again, I will repeat, whatever evidence you want to accept, you accept that, and I will tell you which evidence I am accepting and then uh, treating my patients on the basis of that, okay? So it has suddenly become, PCOS has suddenly become a significant public health issue with reproductive, metabolic, and psychological features. And one of the most common conditions in reproductive age affecting some people say 8 to 13% of women and some people say even more. And with some people say that 70% of the affected women remain undiagnosed. So even we have a dilemma of not, of not PCOS being called PCOS, and there are the people who unfortunately were PCOS, and you did not diagnose them just because they were what I call my thin hairless PCOS, because there are thin and hairless PCOS also. And every lady who's big with hair is not PCOS. Okay, that is what we have to make sure. And there are so many variations, ethnicity in, in terms of different parts of the whole of America, whole of UK, and of course in Pakistan, when you see different ethnic variations, you will see variations of the syndrome. It can present in all different kinds of ways. So you have to be very, very careful and go back to your diagnostic criteria and say, could this woman have polycystic ovaries on the basis of my diagnostic criteria? psychological, reductive, pregnancy complications, and most of all, the most important, which can actually uh, endanger the life of the woman is ha having insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes, and type 2 and cardiovascular risks also. You know that. Now, how do you diagnose it? As I said, the first thing I told you that it is controversial. So today, what I will tell you, I, I diagnose my PCOS like that. But somebody will say, no, actually, that is also PCOS. So in, that is the challenge that we are facing because of the diagnostic criteria. And especially with or without obesity, as I said, my thin, hairless PCOS and my bigger girls with hair always complicate matters, okay? Now, what, what uh, so that's why we have delayed diagnosis and, and poor recognition. And what, uh, so my, what I go by is Ashri, okay? So whatever information I'm going to give you today is on the basis of the of this guideline which I'm presenting over here. And I always go back to this guideline. And if there is any update, I go by them because I find them to be very, very pragmatic and very, very practical. Okay. 
So this is what I would do. And the initial Rotterdam criteria which came for diagnosis, that means two of the clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism, ovulatory dysfunction, or PCOS on scan. Two out of three, if they are present, then she would have, um, uh, she would have PCOS. But wherever you have irregular menstrual cycles and hyperandrogenism, two things, irregular menstrual cycle, irregular as according to the definition of P group, not according to the definition of a girl who's big, who's got hair on her face, and then she says, I have got irregular periods, and you just type, oh, you've got polycystic ovaries. You know, people laugh when I say this, but uh, Asian women, Mediterranean women, Arabic women, Italian women, Spanish women, we are blessed, destined to have hair, okay? Our grandmothers, our mother's grandmothers, great-great-grandmothers, you all have met them. Have you seen the amount of hair they have on their body? And have you seen the amount of babies they have had? 21 per head. Yes, 10 minimum. Why didn't she have PCOS? Because nobody actually told her. Grandma, you have got hair on your face, you have got PCOS. Okay, that is not a criteria. Girls, come on. You are blessed with hair because of your amazing genetics. Okay, so, and you are obese because you love to go and stop at KFC and McDonald's. Yes, and those chickens are full of estrogen and hormones, which are totally messing up for your whole cycle. Diagnosis is made, you don't have PCOS. Be honest with yourself. If you eat homemade food, no meat, no processed meat, and go out of your house and drive a few miles to get the proper meat, then your period problems will sort, your obesity will go away, and you will not get the excessive androgens out of the processed meat that you so love going and eating. So that is part of the hyperandrogenism I'm talking about. So you have to look at the other causes of hyperandrogenism than saying, oh, yes, I have got PCOS. Okay, that's my take on PCOS. So then comes the adolescence. Unfortunately, you know, the poor young kids from nine years of age, the first question I ask them, what is a nine-year-old doing in my gynecology clinic? A gynecology clinic is for women. What are you doing over here? You've got an overweight teenager with irregular periods sitting in your clinic. And somebody has actually cleverly done an ultrasound scan on her. And guess what the scan is showing? Oh, PCOS, lots of follicles. It fits the Rotterdam criteria, Dr. Malik. You just told us the Rotterdam criteria. Ultrasound, irregular periods. There you go. She has got PCOS. No, that is not the case. Because what you will, what you have to really work hard on your history taking is to look at the physiological adolescence and ovulation, which is so common in teenagers. Do not label these nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds to have PCOS because most of the time they don't. Here is your criteria. Take this side and always put this side and try to put that in a numerical way. Consecutive menstrual interval, more than 90 days, even in the first year after menarche. Okay? This is only one criteria, ovulatory dysfunction. Second one is hyperandrogenism. And third one is the scan. So we are only discussing first the ovulatory dysfunction. Has she got ovulatory dysfunction? How will I know that? only if the menstrual interval is more than 90 days. Or if the menstrual intervals persistently are less than 21 days or more than 45 days, two or more years after menarche. You sit down, you ask her exactly when her menarche was, and then you put this criteria there to then say, tick for the first point of ovulatory dysfunction. 
then lack of periods by 50 at the age of 15 lack of periods at the age of 15 but if the young girl even at 15 does not have breast development then 15 is not the age to have periods for her so you have to calculate if the breast development had taken place at nine years of age then within two to three years of of that the, the periods should come do you understand that is how you have to decide whether this is ovulatory dysfunction or not so don't be quick to just say oh yes irregular periods you've got ovulatory dysfunction i have now given you the criteria to to write it down to actually make it into ovulatory dysfunction okay now if you feel that the, this is pcos and it is fitting your criteria you can start treatment okay but i majority 99 percent of my time in my clinic i prefer deferring the diagnosis of pcos while offering symptomatic treatment and providing regular frequent follow-up for the symptoms okay i don't treat pcos because there is no treatment of pcos that's why 100 people are asking me what is the treatment of pcos there is no treatment of pcos that's why you all nobody has taught you any treatment of pcos you have to manage pcos you have to give symptomatic treatment and most importantly you have to give lifestyle treatment we can sit here and, and argue for hours whether she has pcos or whether she hasn't got pcos but no one of us will ever argue whether she has to reduce weight or whether she doesn't have to reduce weight. Would you agree with that? 100% everyone will agree. She has to reduce weight. Okay. So that is how. So I, I am not quick to label her a PCOS. Because I am going to see, as you will see in these slides, how hard I am going to work on her with her other presentations of PCOS. Okay. Whatever she will present, I will work on that one. I will work on her obesity, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, if that is present in, in her, okay? And I am going to think of other causes of hyperandrogenemia and other causes of irregular menstrual periods. And believe me, for me, the other causes of hyperandrogenemia is diet, rather than thinking about, oh my God, you have got a tumor or you've got a hyper a cortisolemia or, or, or any thyroid dysfunction. But of course, you will have to check these because these are the other causes of virilization which you don't want to miss. And I have, but for me, other things are, are more important. Now, if you want to remember one thing out of this lecture, one thing, please remember this. Okay. Do not pick up the scan ever to use it as for a diagnosis until from eight years of menarche. So remember that girl I'm talking to you who came to my clinic, yeah. who's 10 years of age, nine years of age, mm -hmm. has got irregular periods, and somebody has scanned and shown me this massive big ovary saying, ah, oh, she's got PCOS. No, according to ESHRI criteria, she should never have had a scan to put that third criteria of the Rotterdam criteria of the scan diagnosis eight years eight years from anarchy you cannot add the scan anymore so throw that point away and concentrate on the irregular periods and the hyperandrogenemia okay and treat that manage that and forget about the scan stop scanning these young girls mm -hmm. directly from the guideline that i am telling you of course to look at the ovary you need to do a vaginal scan and majority of these girls are not sexually active and so even if you're doing a vaginal scan you have to have a very good bandwidth a proper machine to tell you that the yes the number of follicles per ovary were how many and whether there was a difference in corpus luteum or not because so many times what happens is that you have the older machine and they cannot see this and they keep on seeing this beautiful um uh, corpus luteum cysts and the uh, 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 normal cysts of the ovary saying, ah, endometriosis. Oh, sorry, PCOS. Okay. And trans abdominal scan in a big girl who can see anything. Everything is an ovary, isn't it? So, keep that out of the 
certification petition. And if you are going to give them, write down a clear protocol. Don't just go down and plain English PCS because the patient can read that. Mm -hmm. And now let the patient become a teacher in her head. You have to put down the last menstrual period, the transducer the bandwidth uh, frequency, which route you use, what was the follicular number in the ovary, and each follicle was it measuring two to nine millimeters? You, did you do a three dimensional uh, 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 three images you have to see of the ovary, and you have to see the endometrium? So, write down a good report to convince me when you are saying, Dr. Marek, she has got. Um, she has got a polycystic ovary. Again, as I said, if she has got hyperandrogenism and ovulatory dysfunction, you don't need to scan her to tell me she has got PCS. Then you will have to work on other things and treat and, and, and get rid of the symptoms than any other thing. AMS should not be used. So many people do AMS. Still, we do not have any proper research to say that we should use AMS. Okay. Now, if you will see that I have put that as my first discussion point. Eating disorder or disordered eating? What has this lady got? How many times do you sit there with somebody with irregular breathing and overweight and say, PCS? Hmm. How many times you sit down and talk about the psychological therapy? Whether you it takes two minutes to take a good history and do a soft, soft screening tool. How many gynecologists are actually taught to do a soft code? Does your weight affect the way you feel about yourself? Are you satisfied with your eating pattern? Simple question. Off you go. And then you will get the answer that yes, if, if that is the case, then you go on and you do your other screening and you have your other friends who are going to help you now to help this, uh, this, this patient. There is so many ethnic variations and I have put down there but I will ask you one question. Unfortunately, when you are uh, in Pakistan, you will see, unfortunately, because of the uh, increased poverty in our country, how many times the, the, the masi in your house, the lady who, the servant who works in your house comes to you and brings her daughter and says, Baji, meri bachi ko to PCOS hai, aap iski treatment kar How many times? All the time that poor girl would have what? Iron deficiency anemia. Yes. And she will have every other cough and fever and infection and everything. Why doesn't she have PCS? If she's part of the same country, same ethnicity, everything is the same. What is the difference between the, uh, the, the servant and the master? What they eat. Food habits. <laughs> So when all the Masi girls will also have PCOS, then I will rest my case. And I will say, yes, there is, a, there is a great increase in the genetics of our country and everyone is having PCOS. Mm -hmm. OK, so I rest my case on that one. Um, we will talk about this. Now, in assessment and management, you will see there is lots and lots on these slides. And that is because I wanted to break down the guideline for you, so you take it away and you read it in a in a breakdown way. Because if you sit and read that guideline, it is this thick. So this is one thing that I have done for you to take it away. And I will only discuss what I have written on the top, and then we can cover the other things in your uh, question answer session. Depression and anxiety. Okay, if there is somebody who's big, who's got hair on her face with irregular periods, and she is unable to lose weight, what will she first have? Depression and anxiety. And this depressed and anxious girl, you are sitting there saying, go lose weight, go lose weight. You have to help her. And when somebody is depressed, they are not motivated to lose weight. They will sit and just pile on the pounds and pile on the pounds and then tell everybody and her mother will say, oh, because she has got PCOS. No, because she's sad and upset and depressed. And that is why she's piling on the pounds. So let's look and help her with her depression and anxiety, and then we will deal with the, with the PCS. Similarly, if you find a bad glucose tolerance, a diabetic a phenotype, you have to treat that. And just don't blame the PCS. Look at her as a diabetic patient. And this is the disease which is for life and has to be, has to be treated. These patients suffer, suffer from obstetric sleep apnea, and nobody asks them that. Then they will have so many problems in sleeping 
that their mood is not uh, in a problem. They have got high amounts of carbon dioxide. All these problems is obstetricity puppy, and they will have the signs and symptoms of that. And nobody is addressing that because nobody asked that question. Yes? Endometrial cancer, you know that if you will leave these women to have irregular cycles, and then even in their 30s, even in their 40s, they are going to have endometrial cancer. So transvaginal scan and endometrial biopsy for them is extremely important. You have to help them to improve their quality of life by properly quality of life questionnaires. Get your psychologist friends to help you to help these women. And don't just lecture them and send them home. And, and have, give them that comfort of telling everybody, I have got PCOS. That's why all these problems are because I have got PCOS. Don't let them hide behind that and go and help them. They suffer from severe uh, psychosexual disorders. And again, we have to sit down and take a good history to help them do that. There are so many steps that you can help to uh, identify their body image. There is no, no body image, no uh, weight that we can say that weight is normal. Or at that weight, you look beautiful. If you are not that weight, you will not look beautiful. Whatever your weight is today, you can look beautiful if you just put a lovely smile on and you wear the specific kind of clothes which are good for your, your, uh, your body type, your skin color, your personality. So today you are overweight and you can look beautiful. It's all about the body image. You can't just sit there and say, because I'm not of a particular weight, so I'm not happy with my body image. That is the confidence that you, are, you have to give to your patient to make her happy, less anxious, for then to work towards, towards improving her, her weight and, and her, her disease. Okay? And uh, we talk about, you know, we give so much information, especially in the UK, UAE, in other languages. So we have to make sure that we, we understand what the patient is, 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 uh, is, um, uh, is when we are talking, talking to the patient. So uh, as I said, I 99% of my patients, I don't treat them with medicine. So 99% of my lecture has not mentioned any medicine because you all are more, uh, you all know all the medicines that give, give metformin, give metformin, yes? And what else you want to give? Put, put them on the pill, put them on the pill or do metformin, okay? I don't, I don't do that because I will go, as I said, with my behavioral strategies, my lifestyle intervention, my dietary interventions, exercise interventions, obesity and weight assessment, and I get my other friends to help me uh, to, to do all this for me as in a multidisciplinary team and not just as a one therapist. Okay. If, if you are going to start them on the pill, if you are going to start them on the metformin, before you ask me, I'm going to ask you, yes, when are we going to stop it? So an 18-year-old, you are going to start her on metformin without any uh, insulin problems or uh, you know, when are you going to stop her? And uh, so what I always say is treat what she wants. So she wants to have a baby and she has got PCOS, then you help her have a baby to the fertility treatment. If she is overweight, you help her lose weight. If she has got too much hair on her face, help her to have laser treatment, skin treatment, other things to help her get rid of the hair on her, on her face. And if she has hyperandrogenism, treat the hyperandrogenism and the causes of the hyperandrogenism. Okay, so th this is this is my take. Uh, my take to PCOS. Let's see what what you all have to ask around it, and then I will ask you. We can discuss it. Thank you, Dr. Fadia. So a question that I'm getting is that um, so you said that you have some patients who are your thin, hairless PCOS patients. So. A lot of the management, as we know, is like lifestyle, diet. So what would be diet management of patients who are thin, not obese, not near obese? What is the problem? So she's thin and, okay. and she hasn't got any hair. So what is the problem is irregular periods. Mm -hmm. That is the only problem, right? So how will we treat that? By, by giving her cycle cell, either we can give her the oral contraceptive pill. If she doesn't want to get pregnant, then we will put her on the pill. Easiest thing, thing for thin people is to put them on the pill. And the pill is the one tablet that you can start and then don't stop till you are 40, 45 years of age. And the pill is being used by not 1 million, 
one billion women at one time mm-hmm. and has been used being used for the last my god 100 years okay so if taking the pill for so many years would give you any problem which your mother says it will and your grandmother definitely says ye zara pani aur ye nahi khani chahiye so at least mujhe to zarur pata hota aur i would have told you that if you take the pill for so many years you will not have a baby that is the first thing of course people tell you yeah the pill is so beautiful that it 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 makes the ovary go to sleep it it does not let you lose an egg every month okay so it it has got so many benefits so for me if you're thin and and you you don't have have any hair and somebody has told you that you've got follicles on your ovaries and you are having less than four period uh, in a year then i can give you uh, the pill to regulate your cycle or we can okay. give you withdrawal bleeding every so you just need four periods this is another message i have to give to all the thin featured people mm-hmm. you just need four to five periods a year to allow the shedding of the endometrium you really don't need 12 pe- clock work periods if you just help your pe- your endometrium to shed every 3 to 4 months that will reduce your risk of endometrial cancer and endometrial hyperplasia and that is all you need so what is the problem oh just because you don't oh, have a cycle okay. every month yeah. doesn't make you less of a woman it you are very lucky but of course you have oh, to look okay. exactly you have to, so that takes away the risk of endometrial cancer your your risk of uh, diabetes so if you eat right then you will not mm-hmm. yes you are at risk of developing diabetes but that risk maximum you can take away by not becoming obese and by watching your diet and don't mm-hmm. take up on your weight in your diet and that will be better for your cardiovascular risk you need to see the cardiovascular by people regularly so they will do their markers to make sure that you do not like when when unfortunately very thin people get heart attacks and you think why did they get a heart attack that they have got a problem in the metabolism of their cholesterol and all of that so they can just go to them and and be monitored for that okay all right thank you for answering that um so how many missed periods would you say is like uh, rings the alarm bell for a gynecologist to check their patients for pcos so is so go back 12 months okay uh-huh. so go back 12 months so in 12 months if you do not have four periods then i'm worried so if you haven't had a period today i will go back and say in 12 months how many periods did you have so i know you are pcs i want to help you first thing i would have any way put you on the pill if not then i will say how many periods so if you say that for four uh, that in 12 months i only had two periods i must give you some medicine to help you have a withdrawal bleeding and then i will also can you and see whether you have a thick endometrium or not or actually there is um uh, there is not much endometrium over there okay okay and a lot of uh girls um observe changes in their period in ramzan specifically so now obviously there's a lot of diet changes in ramzan but a lot of uh, females do record that they got their period maybe twice in ramzan the one month they didn't want uh, any more days So is that normal is, is that because of fasting or what is that because of it just so proved my point 11 months i am i am saying a point yeah and people don't believe me that diet and periods diet and periods are related people don't believe me alhamdulillah ramadan comes diet changes time changes everything changes and the cycle changes so yeah. my point is proven yes yeah the, the periods are directly linked to what you eat okay because of the of the androgenic effect of the medicine that or the food that you are eating yes every yeah, time yeah. you will eat outside you will have irregular periods the people who eat outside more will have problems with their periods yeah. the people who are stressed will have problems with their periods you always when a woman comes to doctor Honestly, I had regular periods. I had clockwork periods. I don't know what is going on for the last three, four months. My periods are really irregular. Since Ramadan has come, my periods are irregular. Okay. Have you been teaching your uh, student, your children online? Yes. And I hate online teaching. I can't cope with it. 
and then when Ramadan is coming, oh, I don't know why Ramadan should all be about, you know, uh, what shall I say, connecting to your interior, winding down, all of that. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. many cultures, Ramadan is all about winding up and then mm -hmm. and preparation and food, food, food. And who's going to do that? And who's going to do that? So women get themselves in such a kerfuffle and all of them end up yeah. this, this stress about if I can just mention this, another big, that I don't want a period in Ramadan because I yeah. will have 30 days of fasting. You know, yeah. people come to you, they have got regular periods, but they say, no, I want to delay my periods. I want to do this to my periods, that to my period, so that I don't get 30 days. Allah didn't ask you to do that. Yes. So if you meddle, and before Ramadan only, they're getting stressed. Oh, I'm going to miss the last 10 days. I'm going to miss the first 10 days. Can you do something? Or I wish that that wouldn't happen. You mm. never say that in the next of the 11 months. But you always kind of start getting yourself into that for Ramadan. And of course, everything goes wrong. <laughs> Just take it yeah. as a normal, regular cycle. If any, if Allah yeah. would have said to all the women, Ramadan is coming, women, go to all the Hakeem and make sure yeah. you only yeah. keep 30 fasts in one month. Then I would help you. Allah didn't say that. You miss some months, you miss some fast, you have got 11 months. Allah is so kind. He only wants 30 fasts in, in one, in 12 months, yes? As mm -hmm. many you can do in Ramadan, alhamdulillah, that was from him. The rest, if you couldn't, you complete it in the next 11 months. Okay. Don't be greedy. Yeah, okay. So um, another question is, last question, and then we can continue. So uh, at the beginning of the PCOS session, you said that um, anyone eight years after monarchy, no cysts should alarm PCOS. No so cysts. are those uh, cysts then because of their, maybe because of their obesity, or is it, are, are they in the category of like, um, should they be uh, worried about PCOS in the future? No, because if they have hyperandrogenism or an irregular mm -hmm. cycle, okay, then you have to see this girl as she grows up. And in those eight years, what mm -hmm. are you going to tell the mother? No KFC, no McDonald's, don't take her out, don't give her food, junk food, exercise, skeletal exercise, skeletal exercise. Help her mm -hmm. to lose weight. And the mom mm -hmm. and dad should lose weight. Big parents have big children. Mm -hmm. How can you sit there big yourself and say, this daughter of mine is a beast? Mm -hmm. So help her lose weight, give her the healthy choices. And then after those eight years, if she hasn't lost weight, hasn't changed her lifestyle, of course, she will have all the signs of PCOS. But if you mm -hmm. didn't help them so many years ago and label them with PCOS, she's going to sit there putting on weight, saying, I've got PCOS. Mm -hmm. So that's why. And with the ovary, always remember, I call it practice running. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, uh, you are a medical student. You know more than me the, the menstrual cycle. I'm just scared anybody is going to ask me a menstrual cycle question and then I have to read the book. So um, the ovaries are quiet. Okay? Yeah. And then the, the hypothalamus pituitary starts to work. Okay. Now, this is like playing where they, I call them practice runs. Okay, these are mm -hmm. practice runs. How can you be perfect? It's like you playing tennis with Roger, Roger Federer on the first day and saying, I'm going to beat Roger Federer. Mm -hmm. No, you have to have that. Your ovary has to have many, many practice runs before it becomes like the ovary of the mother. Okay. Mm -hmm. You will get the mother sitting there saying, this is my daughter and her periods are not once a month clockwork and she's nine years of age or 10 years of age. Give her time. So the eggs are sitting quietly in the ovaries. Yes, The hormone comes from the brain and knocks on the ovary and say, come on, I want you to throw an egg. And the ovary says, I'm really not in the mood because it's a teenage ovary. It really doesn't want to do much work. So it will be knocked and it mm -hmm. says, all right, okay, what do I do? And the hormones say, come yeah. on, squeeze an egg. Come on, I want you to get a few crops of eggs. Okay. And the ovary say, how do I do it? How do I, should I make all of them? And all of the crops would come. And you will see this ovary balloon with some eggs. 
Now what do I do? Let's throw an egg. And the LH surgeon will <laughs> And I said, okay, I'll throw an egg. And then the period will happen. Oh my gosh, he's had a period. And then Obi says, I really don't like doing that. So I'm going to not do that for another three months. Mm -hmm. And then, be, and then the, the child is sitting in front of me with her mother saying, doctor, she had one period and then she didn't have a period. I said, just let the ovary do its thing, follow the healthy rules, healthy diet, and then the teenager will not have any problems. And stop looking at that ovary through a scan. Because going through different, different kind of phases, which cannot be explained sometimes, you know. Mm. Okay. That's why the guideline okay. is saying stop so, looking at it for eight years, you know. Yeah. So um, I understand we're going to discuss management of PCOS after this, right? So through the management, is it like we can see that the cysts have reduced and... Um, this is the management. Yeah. Okay. This is all the, I already discussed the management. Okay. Yes. In which yeah. I did not use any tablet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let it sink in. Let it sink in. I am not I'm an international <laughs> speaker and I'm not going going to give you any medicine to manage PCS. No. Hmm. 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 So um okay. So the pill and metformin, those are used when after plan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so if if you if you will are not going to do li uh, lifestyle changes, if you are not going to help her lose weight, if you are not going mm -hmm. to help her improve her mood, if you are not going to get her to do cells and exercises, you are just going to say go take the pills. You can't do that mm -hmm. to regulate your cycle. Mm -hmm. Just put things into perspective, and you will say okay, take metformin. Is, yeah. is that going to treat her? No. Mm -hmm. So she will be forever your patient. Then she's yeah. going to get married. She's going to get married, and then she will not have regular ovulation, and she will not have a baby. Then, so oh, for someone who, yeah, for someone who's P, who has taken the management, who has improved, who has lost weight, and their PCOS has uh, resolved, do they still have any risk of infertility or diabetes in their future? Yes, the diabetic, the real phenotypes yes have a risk of mm -hmm. endometrial cancer diabetes and and uh, cardiovascular risk okay that stays with us mm -hmm. but a risk is a risk it doesn't mean they are going to have a cardiovascular effect event yes mm -hmm. so which one is going to have definitely have a cardiovascular event the one who remains obese the one who, mm -hmm. who does not check her cholesterol or doesn't do dietary skeletal exercises she will be at a higher risk as compared to the others, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So the same philosophy will go through these people. I always look at PCOS like diabetic. If you are diabetic, yeah. you, you, you don't start insulin on the first day. Do you start insulin on the diabetic on the first day? Until, and of course, it's, it's no. needed and what? It is always lifestyle, isn't it? Yeah. It is always life control. There may be metformin. And if they're not listening to, to you, what does the doctor do? Start insulin. Mm -hmm. And then, then they will, of course, this is the patient who's going to have all the diabetic risk. Yeah. Endometrial cancer and, and cardiovascular risk. Yeah. So why do we why do we make PCOS into such a unknown, un you know, phenomena? Why yeah. it is exactly the system? of PCOS. Diabetic patients have great difficulty in conceiving. You know that. The, the yeah. uncontrolled diabetic. But the well-controlled diabetic, they have a baby every year. Yeah. So what is the problem? Yeah. When you label someone, oh, you have got PCOS and now you will not have baby. End of story. She's yeah. not going to have baby. Because she has got PCOS. She will not ovulate. Yes, there are the, the real PCOS will have problems in ovulating, but that doesn't mean every single PCOS will have problems in ovulating. If they look after themselves mm -hmm. and do the right things, they will not have problems in ovulating. How many times you will see a woman with PCOS when she loses weight, she gets better? How many mm -hmm. times I have seen? Mm -hmm. Yes. And if she is still then of course 
I have I have taken away um, from the sectors deliberately. I took away um, fertility treatment for T cells, right? Because this is not as a gynecologist my my role. Yeah. If somebody is not getting pregnant, always remember that, please. This is the twenty first century. If yeah. somebody is not getting pregnant because of T cell, because mm -hmm. of whatever, 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 a gynecologist should not be helping her. A fertility specialist should be helping. Her. If your gynecologist is also a fertility specialist, great. But you know, for to be a fertility specialist, it takes ten years of training, separate to the gynecology training. Yes. So I want to go to that fertility specialist who has put in ten years to then say. I'm so glad you asked that question. The simple answer is no. What are, What are the pain medications? You see, mm -hmm. because uh, I always say, when you are not having a baby, there are everything is a reason why you're not. Everyone has a reason. So if you have got ten relatives, there are ten reasons they will tell you why you're not having a baby. So one of them will always say it was because of the pain medications. No, the pain medications are to are to help you. Every single girl who is suffering from period pain, please take methanamic acid. Okay. At the first day of the period, 500 milligrams, or you can take up to one gram BD. Just take methanamic acid. It's a baby drug. It hasn't got very little side effects. Just take one shot. So if you start it on the first day, before you get the real bad cramps, then you will not have to use brufen, and you will not have to use other diclofenac. Brufen can damage your kidneys. Okay, you will have no kidneys and will die of renal disease. I think that is more important than not having a baby because if you're not alive, you can't have a baby. So concentrate on the things which, which are simple and safe, and don't affect your health, rather than fertility. So simple answer is no tablets like brufen, and um, and 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 methanamic acid and paracetamol. They don't affect fertility, but start less dangerous ones because brufen and voltrol. Are, are dangerous for your kidneys. Okay. Okay. And um, how strong is the genetic link for PCOS? Or is it mostly lifestyle? Lifestyle, 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 lifestyle. Okay. That is why I'm saying that if you if you say, my theory is that I may be wrong. They are doing lots of research on the genetics. Okay. Lots and lots of research on the genetics. And uh, we still haven't found something or whatever, but I will come back to the same point that I said. Mm -hmm. That why is it that the less fortunate of the community don't come up to the doctor with this? Why is this the disease of the fortunate only? They have the same phenotype, they have the same genetics. Why don't they have it more? Is my question. The diet. The diet habits. The lifestyle. Oh. The lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. All right, so thank you, Dr. Sadia, for your session today, for joining us today. That was actually very, very informative. Uh, we all learned a lot about PCOS and about irregular bleeding. We had a lot of questions answered as well. Um, the post-evaluation, we had, we had a pre-evaluation and a post-evaluation form um, for your session. So the post-evaluation form has now be sent, ha has been shared into the chat. Um, your session was live streamed onto YouTube and it will remain recorded and it will stay on YouTube. So that link will be shared with you as well. So you can share with whoever you want. And uh, yeah, so the post-evaluation form is in the chat now. So all the participants, I would like it for you guys to go fill that in and um, you guys can, uh, yeah, that's it, that's it. Thank I've you so put, much. I, I put my, sorry, I put my Instagram yeah. link on my both my, um, my presentations, which are there for you. So if anybody has any yeah. questions or Agree or disagree? I'm I'm very happy yeah. to discuss. As I said, these are my uh, my my practice points, and I have given you the evidence on which yeah. I base my 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 practice. It will be great to discuss further. Yeah. So yeah. So um, we're not used to this, but we have a doctor who's on Instagram. <laughs> so her Instagram will be shared with you as well. And so um, you guys can continue. If there's any questions that I missed, uh, you guys can ask her on there, and she'll be available. 
um, to answer your question. We're getting a lot of thank yous. Best session ever. Thank you, ma'am. Great session. Best session of the PCOS. So thank you so keep much. Reading. Keep reading that. I'm, I'm happy to put it. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Inshallah, see you all soon, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. In the future, uh, for the menstrual health and hygiene program, for which I'm the program coordinator, in the future, we'll keep you on board with that more webinars, more issues that keep coming up. So <laughs> now that we start. Give me one minute. Yeah, Sorry. sure. Okay, sure. Because because it is so important for me to talk to uh, the students in Pakistan about following best evidence, okay? Because we were, we were trained to read, read these books, okay? And we still have these books. And I, and I love these books and I still have them. And I love this one a lot because Alhamdulillah, I'm the only Pakistani to have a chapter in this high-risk pregnancy mm -hmm. by Professor James, which, which, which was a big thing for us. And I'm wow. really proud to have a, a chapter on recurrent pregnancy loss in this book, okay? And um, so I would love to talk about recurrent pregnancy loss at some point. But even though we have these books, but for this book, we have got an inter internet uh, link. So when you buy this book, now they give you a link, which will be updated by us as um, authors. We update our chapter all the time. So this book is printed and in my house, but my latest chapter is updated by me only who will change what I've written in my chapter because the evidence has changed now, yeah. yes? So this is how much the evidence changes and our practice changes. So that is just, I'm giving you a very personal example to tell you all to follow the best evidence as it evolves and not as it, it has been published 10, 15 years ago. So that is my take home message. Okay, thank you so much. I'll share the link to the book as well, to the online book. And I've shared the Instagram, Dr. Sadia's Instagram in the Zoom chat link. And I've also shared it into the um, web, uh, WhatsApp groups and the YouTube comments. It'll be up there soon as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Sadia. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. You can, you can now leave, sir. Yeah.